Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And a little programming note before we go any further. If my voice sounds a little different than usual, it's because I'm actually uh, recovering from a COVID-19 infection. So I was fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, had both doses in March and April of this calendar year. Uh, But unfortunately, uh, breakthrough infections happen, and I've been kind of dealing with that this week. So I'm feeling a lot better today than I have all week. Uh, It has not been a super pleasant experience. So even as a vaccinated person, you should still take reasonable precautions as that makes sense to you. Um, and I would still encourage everyone to get vaccinated because uh, some of the thoughts that went through my head this week were, man, if this was this rough with the vaccine, I can't imagine what it would have been like without it. And I started thinking of hospitals and things they really don't want to think about. So thankful for science and for medicine for being able to help me manage this and deal with this as well as I have and while on the road to recovery. But if I sound a little different than usual, that's why. Just want to let everybody know that I am okay and everybody in my family is okay and we're all recovering well. So looking forward to the show tonight, Andy. We certainly wish you a speedy recovery, Adam. Thank you. So during this whole COVID era, a lot of conferences have moved to virtual. And I don't know about you, Adam, but I am certainly a little bit burnt out on how many digital conferences I've had to attend in the last few months about digital conferences. The thing that I think is the right move, but I struggle with at the same time is the production value for a lot of the keynote events or the main presentations because they are produced as opposed to presented live. They are more information dense than ever. And it's overwhelming. Because when you watch a live presentation, there's a natural ebb and flow to it that allows people time to react, to respond, to take the information in. And when you have these slickly produced videos, and I'm not pointing fingers at any one company because our company sure as heck does this at Microsoft. They're really well done and they cover a ton of material, but there's so much material. And Apple does the same things now with their new product announcements. When you have an iPhone announcement and you can zoom around Apple park and, Oh, there's Tim cook. And there's the guy that built the Silicon. And here's the guy that built the camera and here's this and that, or the gal. Um, It's, it's just an overwhelming amount of information. And so these are making the most of a bad situation. And I appreciate that, but Holy smokes, am I ready for in-person conferences again? They're just a completely different need that they solve but I'm I'm appreciative of all the effort of all of the people who work super hard to put on these digital events. They are really well done, and they're the best we've got right now. It's opposed to bringing people from around the world together in one place to shake hands and cough on each other. So, I think for now it's you know it's good. But at the same time, totally acknowledge anybody who's had burnout problems with them or find them hard to follow. I plus one to that. I, I find them really difficult because the rate of information shared is so high. So Microsoft had our main conference called Ignite last week. And just like Adam mentioned, there was a lot of information. And so we thought we would sort through a bunch of the key takeaways that we had for infrastructure, Azure, and security and kind of give you like a rapid fire list of some of the things that we thought were really interesting and that would be pertinent to anyone listening to this show. So first off, I wanted to start with Azure Arc. If you're not familiar with Azure Arc, it's actually a really interesting service that we offer in Azure where you can install an agent on an existing on-prem server or Kubernetes container or or SQL server and essentially extend that management plane to Azure. So it's super cool because you can essentially get modern management from a server in Azure for patch maintenance and 
stats for your for your server like cpu usage memory hard disk all of that stuff so and it works across multi-cloud so google cloud platform aws can also be extended to manage in azure some of the enhancements that they had for that uh it now has enhanced integration with vmware vSphere and also some new native integrations with azure stack hci the hyper converged infrastructure Another cool thing to know if you don't know about Azure Stack HCI is that it is hardware, call it Azure in a box, where you can buy it from a vendor, deploy it in your data center, and it does the same thing where it extends that management to Azure natively from the box. So you see those servers within Azure and can manage them from Azure, even though it is on-prem and in your data center. AVD or Azure Virtual Desktop also has Azure Stack integration, and that is in preview. Another really cool thing is general availability for Azure Bastion. Bastion is also a really cool feature that I think a lot of security defenders should know about. It is a fully managed jump box as a service, and what it does is it essentially provides remote connectivity to any VM that's deployed in a local or peered Azure virtual network. What this means is, you don't need to have a public IP assigned or RDP enabled on your VMs. Azure Bastion serves as that peered jump box. So you would use the Bastion service to access your VMs. A lot of customers who have compliance requirements that you can't have any external facing VMs or RDP enabled to the internet will really like this feature because this allows you to get into those VMs without having that. Love both Arc and Bastion. Really cool stuff. And by the way, Azure Arc is free, like free as in beer. Um, you can do additional things that might cost money with it, but the overall concept of I want to make visible all my things regardless of if they sit on premises in Azure, in GCP, in AWS, and have that, and I'm going to roll my eyes like very visibly here, a single pane of glass. If you want that single pane of glass of all your um, basically infrastructure, servers, VMs, databases, this is the way you can do that. And that's that's really powerful. And you can extend that in a lot of interesting ways from there once you've got it stood up. So there's obviously going to be a little effort involved in extending it to those other platforms. But then once you've done that work, you reap all the benefits from doing it. So definitely check out Azure Arc. Like I said, actually, it's free. So no reason not to. Azure Bastion, I did not know, was not generally available because people already use it like crazy and love it. It's, it's so nice to take away that responsibility of managing access to those VMs. And instead doing it with a just-in-time, already hardened box, essentially, that's hardened as part of a service. And it's not really a VM. You know, Azure Bastion's like, it's it's kind of a PaaS, on, nearly a SaaS offering, really, because it does just, it, it's just there. You know, it's not just like a hardened VM or anything. So it's really cool, um, but great for that scenario because... As security defenders, it does enable that just-in-time, just-enough access, just-enough privilege kind of model that we all aspire to and that bad guys hate. So check that out as well. Windows update for business now controls are integrated directly into Intune, and that update is rolling out this month. Windows 365 now has a virtual TPM chip that enables support for Windows 11, and so we have Windows 11 images that are available to deploy as well. Support for Azure Active Directory joined cloud PCs is now in preview. It's in private preview, and I know a lot of people have been asking about this, but it will be going public preview fairly shortly. We don't have an exact date, but I can tell you it's probably going to be in Q1 of next year. There were also several enhancements in endpoint analytics, most notably desktop analytics. If you use that, which was a way to see your on-prem 
endpoints from SCCM within an analytics portal it used to be something called Windows Analytics, then changed into desktop analytics. And it was only for your on-prem and SCCM managed devices. We've kind of rolled that into endpoint analytics now, which includes all of your Intune and Azure AD joint devices. Desktop analytics is going to be depreciated in January 31st of 2022. So that's going to happen very shortly. So start using endpoint analytics. And to do that, you're going to want to tenant attach any SCCM instances to your Microsoft endpoint manager or just fully co-manage them. And then you'll be able to take advantage of both the Azure AD joined devices and your on-prem SCCM managed ones. Lots of good stuff here from the Windows, uh, t various Windows teams. Um, obviously, Windows 11 was supported in Windows 365 day one. So that's a great way. If you want to start testing Windows 11 in your environment, do it in Windows 365. Azure AD join cloud PCs, just another deployment methodology essentially in Windows 365 that customers have asked for. Tons of enthusiasm for this product across across the board. So if you haven't heard about it in your organization yet, you may soon. Endpoint Analytics has so many great benefits, but I'll just keep it on the Windows 11 train for a second. One of the great features of Endpoint Analytics is that it does do reporting on your Windows 11 readiness for your PC. So that's, you know, been a little bit of a, you know, a hot topic in the past couple of months. And if you want to have better visibility and understanding and do what you can and can't upgrade to Windows 11 right now, if you wanted to, that's reporting that's valuable to take to your management and be like, hey, you know, we ran the report, 75% of our PCs are good to go. So we need to plan for this over the next couple of months or whatever. So I think Endpoint Analytics is awesome. If you're not already using it, you should be. Tons of benefits. That's just one example. Some updates on Edge. Edge for Linux is now GA in the stable channel. IE retirement is June 15th, 2022. So that's coming up. I actually just talked to a customer recently where I was going down their device management setup and part of their checklist actually had make IE the default browser. And I was like, oh boy. So one of the things that was announced at Ignite, which will make it a little bit easier for folks to move to Edge, is we came out with a cloud site list management, which allows you to host the organization site list, the enterprise site list in a compliant cloud location and instead of requiring an on-premise infrastructure to host the site list. So in the past, it had to talk to maybe like a file share on-prem to see what the site list is. Now we have this in the cloud. And so if you're not aware, there's something called Internet Explorer mode in Edge, where you can render your enterprise sites from your enterprise site list in IE, in the old Triton rendering engine, in the Chromium version of Edge. So move to that because IE itself is going to be deprecated, but now you have the ability to render that site within the same browser, and it's a better experience for your users too. So we have this new cloud site list management, which will make it a lot easier for you. Ever hear about a thing and say, I can't believe that wasn't already a thing? That's that for me. I'm, I'm shocked that that's new, but glad that will help customers who, who want to move to that model, and everyone really should. Uh, just a plug for IE mode. It is shockingly seamless. Like, I'm a technologist. And so the first time I went to a site that fired up IE mode, you know, I wanted to find all the rough edges. I wanted to see how crappy this was of an experience. And it is shocking at how well implemented it is. Like, in, and that's coming from a guy from Microsoft. I mean, so whatever, take it or leave it. But it is really, really, really slick. Like, it doesn't all of a sudden bog down the rest of the browser. You don't get some sort of, like, bluey splash screen pop-up while it loads the DLLs or anything like that. It's just, like, you type the URL little a little internet explorer icon appears in the tab and you're in IE mode and the page renders exactly how it should and functions how it should and then you close it and away you go and by the way Andy mentions the the deprecation of internet explorer like the standalone application 
on June 15, 2022. However, IE mode will continue to be supported much past that date. So this is like if you say, oh, no, we, we're not going to be ready by June of next year. You're fine, but you need to use IE mode. So you you may, depending on where you're at in that journey, um, have a driver to start looking and implementing this technology. But I can tell you it's actually really good. Um, I did finally run into a site that used it at Microsoft, and uh, I was shocked at how well it worked. A lot of things for security. One of the things is native support for multi-cloud environments where that Azure Security Center, now called Microsoft Defender for Cloud, has an extension for capabilities into Amazon Web Services, so AWS. A lot of companies look for a compliance tool to have that posturing of whether or not you have a port open to or RDP ex- exposed to the internet or some site that has some vulnerability. Those compliance tools, AWS has their own, but now if you have Azure and AWS in it or GCP or some sort of multi-cloud situ- situation, we have integrated and have NATA support directly for AWS. So now you don't have to have dependencies like AWS Security Hub in order to monitor your AWS servers within Azure. This is something I think is still going to be a growing part of the business and a growing uh, adoption. Because as I talk to a lot of customers, you know, as an example, every single customer has an endpoint protection platform, right? You have antivirus, you might have EDR. This is a place where a lot of customers, honestly, there's still a ton of growth here where a lot of customers still don't have a ton of stuff like in Azure infrastructure or AWS infrastructure for that matter. And they're certainly not to the point of maturity where they have. And of course, like every great security tool, there's already uh, an acronym for it, CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management, which Andy, you kind of made reference to. Um, That's, you know, now a new tool that a lot of companies are going to try to come sell. Uh, Microsoft's going to have an, you know, already has had an offering in this space, but now it becomes really a more of a multi-cloud tool with this really seamless support for AWS. Um, and it is, in, and kind of going back, it is always supported multi-cloud or even on-premises because this is where that tie-in with the Azure Arc comes t- together. Because if you've Azure Arc enabled those servers, wherever they live, GCP, on-premises, AWS, that flows into Microsoft Defender for Cloud automatically. That's already happening. So that's not new. What's really new here is this more seamless experience to connecting to AWS and eliminating the dependencies on the AWS Security Hub. Um, And also a lot of rebranding. So uh, everything is Microsoft Defender now at Microsoft. Um, There's a lot of internal jokes right now of like, hey, what's the mute button called in Teams? Microsoft Defender for volume and stuff like that. Um, But... So this one got renamed Microsoft Defender for Cloud, and I guess we'll just call up the rest as they come up, come along. But just know there's been some rebrands. Azure Defender and Azure Security Center, the one we're talking about here, that's all Microsoft Defender for Cloud now. Um, Azure Sentinel is now Microsoft Sentinel. And then we'll touch on the rest of them as we go through the conversation. One of the biggest announcements, which I think is going to be a huge benefit for our customers, is Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Plan 1. So if you aren't familiar with Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, it used to be just an offering for like an E5 or the highest SKU possible. And if you just had the E3 SKU, which is your most organizations have Windows Enterprise, and that comes with the built-in Windows Defender or Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. And what a lot of customers complained about was the lack of visibility into what it was doing. Like, we're just kind of like, it does its job, just trust us. But there wasn't any UI to show what was going on. And what this provides is that UI. And so it gives you a lot of the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint stuff that came with the larger and more expensive SKU, except without some of the EDR capabilities of automated remediation and some of the investigation, but 
for the most part, you're able to see the logs, you're able to see the incidents pop up, and it's all within the Defender for Endpoint portal, which was not lit up for you previously. Now it is. And so if you are an existing E3 customer, M365 E3 or Windows Enterprise customer, you're going to get this. You can also buy it standalone or part of the suite. So huge, huge benefit for customers. Um, it's also included for all the different operating systems that Defender for Endpoint is on, Mac OS, Android, iOS as well. This is this is definitely really interesting. And and for anybody who is kind of bought in at the E3 level and, and doesn't own a lot of the E5 security tools, which I understand is sometimes a contentious conversation with security professionals. Here is an example where we Microsoft frequently points to adding more value to the E3 stack over time. And, and again, I, I know who signs my, signs my paychecks and you all do too, but I think that's not like me carrying water for the company. Cause again, we do this podcast outside of our work um, to say that a lot of stuff's been added to that over time because I had E3, I deployed it back at an insurance company in West Des Moines, Iowa back in 2013. Like, there's no such thing as Microsoft Teams. There's no such thing as Microsoft Stream. There was all of this stuff that wasn't in it at all that's in there today. You think of Teams alone and what's been added to that is just insane. This is more value that's being added to that suite. So I, I, I hope folks remember that occasionally um, there is a lot coming to that suite over time. There's been a lot of investment there, but this is really significant because... I think, I think most customers, most um, security professionals today recognize that Microsoft is really good threat intelligence. Like from an antivirus perspective, Microsoft's going to have a really broad and deep set of signal and be able to respond really quickly to new threats, zero day and, and things of that ilk. And they've said like, I've had customers say like, I'm bought in. Like, I believe in the vision. I believe you have like great antivirus. And right now that's all I have. I have Symantec, you know, I've got, oh gosh, what, what's their base antivirus called anymore? SEP, Just, you know, we have SEP and we'd love to replace SEP because LOL Symantec Broadcom, you know, kind of thing. Um, however, you guys don't have the manageability we need. You don't have the visibility we need. You don't have the logging we need. Like I trust the agent is going to be great. It's going to protect us better, but I have to prove this, that, and this, I have to have an audit trail. I have to have a log, whatever you need. I need to have manageability so that when I push it to these new endpoints, I can change the settings and I don't have to figure out like, well, do I do that in configuration manager? Or do I do it in Intune? Like you just go to this portal and you do it, you know, with semantic, that's how it works. And this kind of gives an answer to that. And so the thing is for a lot of companies who haven't moved to EDR yet, haven't moved to TVM yet, but just need a really robust antivirus solution, and you're an E3 customer, Microsoft 365 E3, you now own this. You now own a great antivirus platform with manageability and visibility and cross-plat support across Windows, Mac OS, Android, and iOS that's pretty a pretty nice additional offering that just showed up on your doorstep. So hopefully some of our listeners can take advantage of this because this is a nice, significant additional offering that kind of came out of nowhere that you didn't have this six months ago and now is becoming available. Another really cool thing that I didn't know much about until I started investigating it more was Microsoft Defender for IoT, which was also renamed. It used to be called Azure Defender for IoT. But IoT and OT devices are notoriously difficult to secure because uh, they're most of the time unpatched, they're unmonitored. And so Microsoft Defender for IoT is an agentless solution that can be used to extend and discover, most importantly, discover. Uh, enterprise IoT devices like VoIP phones, smart conferencing systems, building automation systems. And then it can also secure OT devices like uh, ICS devices in sectors like manufacturing, energy, 
water, oil, and gas. There's also a lot of deep integrations that were completed over the last few months that were announced with uh, Sentinel and Defender, of course, but also supports third-party SIMs like Splunk, QRadar, and then ServiceNow. So really cool uh, set of features that we have there. Definitely look at it if you have IoT or OT devices. Some, uh, some compliance things, too, that were announced is that Microsoft DLP, Data Loss Protection, and Insider Risk Management are now available on Mac OS, and that's in preview. And then there was a bunch of enhancements in Microsoft Information Protection. So automatic labeling now is a little bit more robust with machine learning trainable classifiers. And I found this one to be pretty cool. When you encrypt Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint files, and then you export those to PDF, now the labeling and encryption will persist. And so even if you're changing the file type, the information protection label that you've given to it will stay. So that's another improvement in Microsoft information protection. So going back to the Microsoft Defender for IoT for one second, I think you summarized everything in it well. I have nothing to add other than that was an acquisition Microsoft did a couple of years ago called CyberX. Um, and it's now the currently named product and has been integrated into the rest of the stack. If you are responsible for security at your company, we've seen how OT and IOT networks have started to be used as part of cyber attacks. Just make sure you're asking the questions. Like you're not trying to go do somebody else's job, but you're just asking the questions like, how are we protecting this? What are we doing? Because there are tools in place because you'll get pushback. Like we don't want anything on those systems anyway. Like totally get that. Of course you don't. Having a agentless solution that's just watching kind of the traffic over the network is still a heck of a lot better than nothing. So ask those good questions and just, you know, not your job necessarily, but it's everyone's job to protect our organizations and, and see where we're at on that. And then on the information protection stuff, a couple of funny notes, um, the endpoint data loss prevention capability on Mac OS Somebody told me that got announced a couple weeks ago. And I said, what do you mean that just got announced? It's been on my Mac forever. And they're like, oh, we're just now talking about that. So my Mac, as you'll recall, is enrolled in Intune um, internal to Microsoft so I can use it to conduct con company business. And apparently I had been kind of dogfooding that DLP agent now for quite some time on my Mac. So this isn't something that's you know necessarily hot off the press and, and nobody's kind of given it a look at. It's been on my Mac for quite some time now, and I was actually kind of shocked that that had not been publicly announced. As you can imagine, sometimes it's hard to keep track of what's even been publicly disclosed versus not yet. Um, and with the machine learning trainable classifiers, that sounds like a big mouthful, but let me give you an easier example. Let's say you have a certain type of document that you always want to receive a certain sensitivity label. You can take a hundred of those dump them in a SharePoint document library, point the trainable classifier at that document library and say, here's a hundred examples of this document when it's been filled out and completed, learn what that looks like. So the next time you see one, you can automatically label it a certain way. That's what trainable classifiers are. So that's really, really cool tech where it allows you to train a computer to do something that might be hard to articulate in like an algorithm in like a very programmatic sense but machine learning can do super easily. So some interesting use cases there. There's also some built-in ones from Microsoft that look for things like resumes, source code, offensive language, threats, harassment, etc. So lots of cool stuff there beyond what you'd expect with your kind of old school credit card number, social security number. Some identity announcements, Azure Active Directory identity governance can now reach more business critical apps, including ones that are hosted on premise or in private clouds. Adam and I were talking about this in the pre-show and it's pretty cool that you can extend provisioning to apps that are hosted on prem and in private clouds because it was only limited to Azure Active Directory apps previously. So we're not exactly sure how it works yet, but it is in preview right now. 
And so I'm sure there's going to be more coming down the pipe about that. But just know that that capability is coming and we are consistently improving on some of the capabilities that we have already. Conditional device, conditional access device filters is also now generally available. These are really nice because instead of using something like a dynamic device group in Azure, you can now use device filters and apply conditional access to the device filters. Device filters do the logic processing within Microsoft Endpoint and Dynamic Device Groups does the logic processing within Azure. So depending on where you want that logic to be processed, a lot of times when it comes to devices, you want it to be in Endpoint Manager, which is why in almost near time processing, you can get a filter to be populated with the right information and to apply the right policies to it. Whereas if you're doing that logic processing within Azure, it has to pass that information over to endpoint and then process the policies. So really neat feature. It's generally available now. You can also do conditional access app filters where admins can tag applications with custom security attributes and then apply conditional access policies based on those tags. So just more granular control. Continuous access evaluation. Adam and I have talked about this feature previously. It was in preview, and now it is generally available. So that allows the continuous monitoring of each access session and so that you can enforce policy in real time. If something critical is detected, you can then apply policy based on that event. CAE, conditional, continuous access evaluation, is cool in the sense that it makes everything else better because what that essentially does is shortens that time span that used to be an hour of lifetime of an access token before a device would check back in with its refresh token and go back through the conditional access kind of meat grinder, if you will. With continuous access evaluation, that happens much more frequently than one hour which means if a device becomes non-compliant or you know any of the factors involved change that can happen much 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 more quickly which obviously is a win when your controls are being enforced near to real time so all the cool stuff Andy mentioned that all gets made better because of CAE we understand that not everyone who listens to the show is an enterprise customer too so there are a lot of improvements for small businesses. Microsoft Defender for Business is a new offering that was announced at Ignite. So for organizations up to 300 employees, there's an endpoint solution that is going to be a new offering that kind of bundles up all of the endpoint protection for small businesses. Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps is the new name for Microsoft Cloud App Security, MCAS, which is our CASB solution, another acronym, Cloud Access Security Broker. So now that is known as Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. App Governance, which provides app behavior context within Defender for Cloud Apps, is now available as well. It's designed to identify anomalous behavior for OAuth-enabled apps that have access to M365 data. We've also expanded the native API integration to include other cloud apps like Slack, Smartsheet, Zendesk, and One Login. And then Defender for Cloud Apps has extended discovery of shadow IT to macOS devices deployed within the environment using the integration with Defender for Endpoint. So if you have the Defender for Endpoint agent on the machine, it now can extend the apps on that machine and discover them within Defender for Cloud Apps. For Endpoint Manager, Linux Desktop Management is going to be available. That's in preview as well. You're able to actually enroll Linux desktops into MEM and apply security policies and conditional access policies to Linux desktops. That's something I know that a lot of organizations have asked for a long time, and it is now available in preview. 
endpoint manager to manage Mac OSs beyond just the PKG files. So previously, if you were trying to deploy apps to Macs, they had to be in the .pkg format. But now you can manage and deploy non-PKG apps using Intune. And then for records management teams, there was a lot. One of the things that I picked up, which is a feature that a lot of people use, is private channels within Teams. And if you had a private channel, previously the retention and deletion policies were limited in that. So now there are retention and deletion policies for private Teams channels, and they're generally available. I love anything that helps small businesses because I think they're at some of the highest risk for cyber attacks because they just, it doesn't make sense for them to staff up a whole security firm and they're just not really well suited to protect themselves today, but they have a lot of the same attack surface as an enterprise size customer, maybe less of it, but the same type of attack surface. So love that offering. And I think all the security companies need to continue to do more to reach those customers and help them in ways that are really, again, apologies for using a buzzword, but turnkey. Um, I pay you money. You fix my security problems kind of thing. It needs to be more like that. Uh, Defender for cloud apps, just one feature, you know, the, the name is very not sexy app governance, but very, very important because as you grant OAuth apps access to Microsoft 365, They have access to a treasure trove of data. So you want to ensure that's just enough privilege and all that good stuff and coming from a trusted source because there's countless examples of this is where, you know, forget like an MFA bypass or a password bypass or anything. You're just giving them the keys to the kingdom. Uh, If you give them the wrong, you know, bad actor an OAuth enabled app access to M365. So anyhow, a uh, defender for cloud apps really, really, really helps with that with some of these new announcements. Uh, Andy, you should have warned the people before you dropped that hell was freezing over that endpoint manager is going to support Linux desktop management. Holy smokes. I fell out of my chair on this one. That is phenomenal news. And then even on top of it, integration with conditional access. What? Like that is, that is really, really, really big for the customers who need it. And obviously Linux is not going away and it's never going to be the year of Linux on the desktop, (laughs) LOL, but there's still people who need it and being able to support it in those apps is really important. Um, I thought the Mac announcement's interesting because our uh, Intune team has kind of had a bit of a, I don't know, an interesting partnership with GM software and really allowing and, and encouraging, you know, Jamf to stay the 800 pound gorilla in that space. And the Intune team is kind of pledged like, you know, we're going to implement the API as Apple gives it in Mac OS and maybe a little bit beyond that. But we have no designs on like continuing to really grow our Mac management beyond that because we'll encourage customers to grow into Jamf if that's what they need. That's kind of been Microsoft's kind of strategy to this point. And I'm not I'm not telling anything that people don't already know or can't already see with their own eyes. So growing the capability in this way to delivering package apps is easy because that's the standard installer for Mac OS. Like it's built to do that. But when you start getting into other methodologies of deploying applications that's that's a lot of work. So the Intune team has been busy and that feels like a bit of scope creep from what they'd articulated a couple of years ago. So maybe a place to keep an eye on here. I know nothing, by the way, and I'm not giving away anything because I'm not briefed on that sort of thing. I'm just saying as kind of an external observer, that's an interesting announcement. Um, I, I, I love getting more capability in Mac OS because I, I love the Mac and I love Surface and Windows as well. Um, So I I think anything like that's always interesting. And I should say for any Linux nerds out there, there's only a few distros that are supported at this time. I can't remember all of them, but for sure Ubuntu desktop is supported and then they're going to extend it to some other ones. I think interesting enough, CentOS is on that list as well, even though CentOS is getting depreciated. But they have a roadmap of which distros are going to support 
most popular, of course, is Ubuntu. And so that one is out there right now. And as far as Endpoint, I don't know if Adam and I have made this point on the show, but there are some things that kind of go hand in hand, like peas and carrots and identity and endpoint management are kind of those two things that I think are key for a strategic vision when it comes to your security program. And while it is really cool that they're deploying applications and extending that capability, I go back and think about how does the user log into the Mac? And most of the time, if you're still using Intune, they're using a local admin or local user to that Mac to log in. So I think Jamf is still going to be pretty important in this space, mainly because they own Jamf Connect, or unless you're deploying Nomad on your own, the open source version of Jamf Connect, where you're integrating uh, an IDP like Azure AD so that you can log into the machine using your Azure AD identity, then I think Jamf is still going to be pretty important in the space for now but certainly like adam said something to keep an eye on because i think it was unexpected that they were going to expand this capability well i think apple too this is this is becoming a pain point even in that community that not having moved past like a local user account is problematic and is becoming more problematic and things like Jamf connect attempt to kind of paper around some of those issues by doing a lot of synchronization and stuff like that but they don't actually fix the core underlying issue that you have this like dependency on this local account. Um, and so I think Apple could help if they add more to the OS, which shockingly Apple has shown themselves like really interested in listening to enterprise customers lately. So you never know. I mean, talk about hell freezing over. Um, it kind of already has in a lot of the Mac space today. Yeah, like you said, I'm I'm surprised that they have not allowed you to use your Apple ID with some sort of passwordless method to log in. Like they have the fingerprint enabled on like a laptop. They have the Apple Watch that you can like log in, but at the core of it, it's still a password to a local administrator. Is this where you crack the jump that Apple is still bad at cloud services? <laughs> Which, I mean, they've, they've clearly gotten way better on, like, if you're making fun of Apple's cloud services today, you're not paying attention because most of them are pretty darn good today. But I, I, I think that does show, like, a little bit of that discomfort. They love, like, hardware solutions, like hardware interplay. Like, Apple Watch Unlock is great, works super well, it's slick. You know, Apple has kicked everybody's butts in biometric. Their biometric unlocks across the board have been phenomenal face ID and touch ID. So, so good. But there's this discomfort with like, you know, you go buy a windows 11 PC today. And if you're a consumer, it's going to want you set it up with a Microsoft account and the default behavior is going to be passwordless to sign into that PC with your Microsoft account that today, by the way, doesn't even have to have a password anymore. So I have a Microsoft account. I have one. There is no password. And I can use that to sign into my new Windows 11 PC that I get. Like, that's, you know, that's where the puck already is. Like, that's not skating to where the puck is going to be. The puck's already there, guys. So what's next? Like, what's the next big thing? It's not local user accounts. So, you know, total side note here, Andy, but a uh, good way to wrap up the, the conversation for sure. Yeah, hopefully this gives you a, a good idea of what was all igno uh, announced at Ignite. There was quite a few, and there's a book of news where we'll link in our show notes as well as all the Ignite sessions are on demand available from the Ignite website. So go ahead and rewatch them if you have time or read over some of the blogs that were published that are linked within the book of news and catch up on that. So if anything piqued your fancy on things that we announced uh, tonight or that we went over tonight, Go ahead and take a look at those uh, resources. Thanks for watching and listening as always. That's our show for tonight. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or follow-up topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.